Um, I'm on Alvarez Boyd. I'm the Senior Associate Director of the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. In that role, um, I have the, uh, the privilege of overseeing community development function that's deployed through the Federal Reserve System and also through a group of researchers and policy experts that I work with in Washington, D.C. It's an incredibly talented team of community development professionals that we work with throughout the country. And we really strive to understand the issues affecting the most vulnerable populations in our communities. This conference is the result of tremendous collaboration across districts. Um, collaboration that comes from the leadership of this bank, of the Cle our Cleveland Bank, as well as Minneapolis and Philadelphia. Um, I really want to give kudos to the folks that put this conference together. These sorts of brave conversations that we've been having here today are exactly the type of thing that we need to be doing. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. Great job. Most people that, um, when I talk to folks out in the, um, in the community and particularly bankers and other central bankers from around the, around the world, they're surprised to hear that the Central Bank of the United States has a community development function. But as you'll soon hear from our closing speaker, the benefits are significant for us as policymakers and for the communities that we work with. It is really my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce the Policy Summit's closing speaker, Loretta Mester. Loretta is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, a position that she's held since June of 2014. Before that, she was executive vice president and director of research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. She joined the Philadelphia Fed in 1985 as an economist becoming Senior Vice President and Director of Research in the year 2000, and Executive Vice President and Director of Research in 2010. Loretta graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Mathematics and Economics from Barnard College of Columbia University, and she earned an MA and PhD degrees in Economics from Princeton University, where she was a National Science Foundation Fellow. Since arriving here in Northeast Ohio, Loretta has become active on several local boards, including as a director of the Greater Cleveland Partnership and a trustee of the Cleveland Clinic and of the Cleveland Orchestra. She's part of the fabric of your community. She also serves as a director of the Council for Economic Education and is managing editor of the International Journal of Central Banking. I have the privilege of working with Loretta, particularly in her role as chair of the Fed's Committee on Research, Public Information, and Community Affairs. So I've seen firsthand the focus and dedication she brings to the Fed's important work in supporting community development. She's truly a partner for me in thinking about community development across the system. So Loretta is clearly a brilliant economist and a strong strategic leader but she also acts as a coach and guide, steering projects to the best outcome by taking everyone's views into consideration. And these are really the hallmarks of effective leadership. I think you've seen that reflected in the dialogue that we're having in this conference. I always learn from her, and I'm confident that you will too. So please join me in welcoming Loretta Mester. Well, thanks very much, Anna, for that really, really nice introduction. And uh, let me take the opportunity to offer my thanks to all of you for actively participating in this year's Policy Summit, and to Mary Helen Petrus and Bonnie Blankenship of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, Teresa Singleton of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and Michael Grover of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis for taking the lead in creating this year's program. Now, over the past 14 years, the Policy Summit has brought together community development practitioners, researchers, funders, policymakers, and others, other people interested in strengthening our communities so that all people 
have the opportunity to productively engage in our economy and to share in its benefits. And as is clear from the many conversations we've had over the past two days, and indeed over the past 14 years of the summit, there are no easy answers. But there are some answers, and I have confidence that your dedication, expertise, and collaboration will result in effective solutions being implemented more widely and even better solutions being devised. And I hope that the discussions over the past two days have inspired you to continue the important work you're doing. Now today, I want to talk about the Federal Reserve's role in the community development arena. I'll touch on the why, the how, and the what of this work. Why we at the Fed see our community development efforts as important to our mission of fostering a healthy economy. How we go about doing this work, and some of what we're focusing on. As always, the views I'll present are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. Now, to begin, it helps to know a little bit about the structure of the Federal Reserve System. To say that the Fed is an interesting institution is an understatement. I've spent my career at the Fed, and I'm still learning arcane things about the Fed's structure and history. The Federal Reserve System was established by an act of Congress that was signed into law in 1913. And we like to say that the Federal Reserve is a decentralized central bank, which is independent within the government, but not independent from the government. The structure is one of balance. Congress designed the Fed to alleviate concerns that it would become dominated by financial interest in New York or political interest in Washington, or by any particular individual group. This is, the design includes representation from the entire nation, balancing public sector and private sector interests, and Wall Street and Main Street concerns. The Federal Reserve System has 12 regional reserve banks that are distributed across the country, and a seven-member board of governors in Washington that oversees those banks. The governors who serve the public are appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. The Reserve Banks also operate in the public interest, and each has a nine-member board of directors whose members are chosen in a non-political process to represent business, agricultural, industrial, bank, and public interests in the districts they serve. The non-bank directors are responsible for, for choosing the bank's president, who is subject to approval by the Fed's Board of Governors. And some of the reserve banks also have branches with boards, and each reserve bank has a number of advisory councils drawing membership from various sectors and geographies in their districts. This regional and balanced structure has served the country well for more than 100 years. The U.S. is very diverse, encompassing large cities, small towns, and rural areas with a mix of different industries and occupations. And the Fed structure allows decisions on monetary policy, financial system regulation and supervision, and payments to take into account the diversity of the American economy and its people. We recognize that our policy decisions affect main streets and communities all across the country. As a participant at the Federal Open Market Committee meetings, I can attest to the fact that the members of the Board of Governors and Reserve Bank Presidents do bring different perspectives to the table. My own perspectives are informed not only by economic and financial data and models, but also by the information gleaned from a diverse set of business, consumer, and labor contacts throughout the 4th District, which includes the state of Ohio, the western part of Pennsylvania, the eastern part of Kentucky, and the northern panhandle of West Virginia. Now, by design, the discussions at our meetings contain a mosaic of economic information and analysis from all parts of the country. The FOMC does not suffer from groupthink. We come together, share our different perspectives, and work to develop a consensus to set national monetary policy in pursuit of our monetary policy goals of price stability and maximum employment, goals that Congress gave us. Now, Congress has also given the Fed independence in making monetary policy decisions. Neither Congress nor the U.S. President has to approve monetary policy decisions, so the decisions are insulated from short-run political considerations. 
At the same time, the Fed is held accountable for its decisions when it regularly communicates the rationale for its policy decisions in testimony before Congress and in policy statements, meeting minutes, reports, and speeches. This system of accountable independence has been shown to yield better policy decisions and better economic outcomes for the country. The regional private-public structure of the Federal Reserve System helps to reinforce this system of independence and accountability by ensuring that diverse information from all sectors of the economy and all parts of the country is brought into monetary policy discussions with the policymakers themselves distributed across the nation and not concentrated in one location. Now, in addition to aiding monetary policymaking, the Fed structure also allows us to perform our other functions more effectively. Of course, one of those is near and dear to everyone in this room, the Federal Reserve System's role in identifying effective community development policies and best practices for promoting economic progress and access to credit in low and moderate income neighborhoods. The origin of the Fed's community development work lies with the passage of the Community Reinvestment Act in 1977. Now, at the time, many people thought that limited access to credit and illegal practices, such as redlining, contributed to the deterioration in low and moderate income neighborhoods throughout the U.S. The CRA was meant to help ensure equitable access to credit for all individuals and neighborhoods by reaffirming that insured depository institutions must serve the communities in which they are chartered to do business. In 1981, the Board of Governors asked each reserve bank to appoint a community affairs officer. And from there, the Fed built a function to provide technical training and support to depository institutions to help bolster com compliance with the CRA. Over time, the Fed's interest and in activities in community development have grown. Partly, this reflects the desire to promote consistent implementation of the CRA across the nation, recognizing that to do this, we need a good understanding of all the interrelated challenges facing lower income communities. But another motivation is, is the fact that our community development activities at the local level, facilitated by the Fed's regional structure, have allowed us to gain valuable reconnaissance on the economic health of people and communities across our districts. Even if the Federal Reserve, along with other federal regulators, were not charged with implementing the CRA, our community development activities would remain an important component of the Fed's work because they help us monitor the health of the economy across various segments of the population and geographies, which is an important component of setting, uh, important component of setting appropriate monetary policy. The financial crisis and ensuing recession provided a vivid illustration of this interconnectedness and the importance of local engagement. As the housing market slowed and the number of subprime mortgage delinquencies and foreclosures began to rise, the Federal Reserve began monitoring these developments more intensively. No doubt, at the beginning, we underestimated the negative effects that problems initially centered in the subprime mortgage market would ultimately have on the broader economy. However, members of the Fed's community development staff were already engaged with industry and, con and consumer advocates who were focused on helping troubled borrowers. These staff members were able to provide firsthand knowledge and objective information to Fed policymakers, raising their awareness that the problems were not insignificant. Fed staff with expertise in mortgage markets and housing in the community development, economic research, and bank supervision functions were mobilized. Our regular contact with local organizations across the country indicated that a lack of data on delinquencies and foreclosures was impeding progress. So Federal Reserve staffs across the country began collecting data. They analyzed delinquency and foreclosure trends and helped to evaluate policies and programs aimed at aiding troubled borrowers and addressing the growing problem of foreclosures. Ohio had one of the highest foreclosure rates in the country, coupled with high numbers of vacant and abandoned properties. So the Cleveland Fed was particularly active in this analysis, working with government agencies, financial institutions, and community-based organizations, perhaps with many of you in this room. 
While our community development work gives us insights into the economic health of communities, which helps inform our monetary policy, monetary policy is not the right tool to address the many challenges facing lower income households and neighborhoods. What monetary policy can do is promote greater economic stability overall by focusing on price stability and maximum employment, and thereby lower the risk of recessions, which disproportionately harm the more vulnerable parts of our society. But an interconnected set of factors determines the economic vitality of households and neighborhoods, including access to credit, capital and financial services, affordable housing, workforce development, job training and education, health and wellness services, and infrastructure, including transportation and broadband services. While monetary policy cannot address issues such as income inequality, the longer run issues of workforce development, or the distributional effects of globalization and technological change, other government policies and private public programs, if they're well designed, can. This is where the Federal Reserve's community development work comes in. Now, the Fed is not the entity that can set these policies or implement these programs, but the Fed is committed to increasing knowledge about the economic challenges facing low and moderate income households and communities and helping to identify effective policies and best practices to address these challenges. I believe the structure of the Federal Reserve System gives us some advantages in doing this work. In particular, our regional structure insulates us from political influence, so we're viewed as a trusted and objective party. We hold that public trust very dearly and always strive to maintain our credibility. That's why we aim to conduct our research with the utmost rigor and the highest quality standards, looking objectively at all sides of an issue and potential solutions. Our reputation for objectivity helps us play an important role as a convener, convener, and I would add also as a catalyst. We all know that the issues facing lower income regions in a dynamic economy such as ours are complex ones. Many of the solutions will be complex as well. At the very least, they'll take committed and collaborative actions from various stakeholders and probably some compromises too. The Fed plays a useful role here by convening forums and workshops with the groups needed to affect change. Such forums foster a common understanding of the magnitude and breadth of the issues, allow best practices to be shared, spur quicker dissemination of insights, and can catalyze action that ultimately leads to more effective economic policies and programs. The Fed values the relationships we have built with key organizations working to improve the economic outcomes of people and communities across the country. I've had the privilege of meeting with many dedicated community development practitioners and engaging with people who live and work in lower income areas in our region. I've seen firsthand that the information my Fed colleagues and I gleaned from such interactions has informed our research and has helped us learn about the promising programs many of you lead throughout the country. For example, the Atlanta, Cleveland, and Philadelphia Reserve Bank's project to identify opportunity occupations, those occupations that pay higher than the median wage but don't require a bachelor's degree, grew out of our hearing repeatedly from various parties of the need for these types of jobs. We've also seen that practitioners and policymakers have used Federal Reserve research. So there are important synergies to be gained by actionable research coupled with convening meetings and workshops. Now, just as getting all stakeholders together can help yield more effective solutions, the Federal Reserve System recognized that the Reserve Banks and the Board of Governors can achieve more by working together on community development issues without sacrificing the focus each Reserve Bank has on particular issues affecting its individual district. The system-wide approach allows us to deploy resources more efficiently, to develop more in-depth expertise that can be shared, to identify those issues that loom large in many parts of the country, and to track emerging economic developments in a way that we couldn't if we weren't regionally distributed and it didn't work together. So I would like to spend the remainder of my time discussing some of the Fed's community development work. 
As I mentioned earlier, many factors influence the economic vitality of households and neighborhoods, including access to credit and capital, workforce development, affordable housing, infrastructure, and health services. There's ongoing research and engagement across the Federal Reserve System in each of these topic areas. Far too much work to summarize in my remaining time. So one focus has been on areas of concentrated poverty, which exist in both urban and rural settings. The Minneapolis Fed Center for Indian Country Development, the Dallas Fed's Colonius Project on neighborhoods along the U.S.-Mexico border, the St. Louis Fed's Delta Communities Initiative, which is working with distressed communities across the Arkansas and Mississippi Delta regions, the efforts of the Atlanta, Cleveland, and Richmond Feds in Appalachia, and the joint efforts among several reserve banks in the industrial heartland and older cities has pointed to some key issues affecting the economic vitality of people and communities in these areas. Workforce development is one of those issues that span regions, and so considerable efforts are underway across the Federal Reserve System and with our community partners to find solutions to ensure that people have access to the education and skill development programs needed to ensure that they can be productive men members of the modern workforce. Our activities focused on workforce development have improved our understanding of the labor market outcomes of different groups and communities and of labor markets more broadly. This work has obvious spillovers to the Fed's need to understand labor market conditions when setting monetary policy. Of course, to make progress on any of the issues facing distressed communities, you need to be able to measure the scale of the problems. In addition, you need to ensure that those with funds and an interest in affecting solutions are brought together with those with effective programs in need of financing. Let me discuss some of the contributions the Fed is making in these two areas. As was clear during the foreclosure crisis, inadequate data can be a sizable impediment to understanding challenges and finding solutions. So the Fed's community development function is providing data and analytical tools to the public. These disaggregated data help us understand emerging issues that can be masked by looking at the aggregate statistics. The Fed's Small Business Credit Survey is a good example. This survey uh, started as individual surveys conducted by a few reserve banks. But under the New York Fed's leadership, it became a common national survey in 2016 with more than 15,000 small business respondents. This survey could not have been carried out without the 400 organizations, including chambers of commerce and economic development agencies that partnered with the Fed to gather responses. The results allow us to track access to credit from several individual segments of the small business population, including minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, startups, micro-enterprises, and the self-employed. Another example of data gathering is the Board of Governors survey of household economics and decision-making, which has been conducted since 2013 and provides data to help track the economic well-being of households. The survey contains information on access to credit, retirement savings, student loans, and other evidence on how households are faring financially. A third example is the data provided by the Dallas Fed and Cleveland Fed on broadband access. Broadband internet access has become a necessity in our connected world, allowing for higher income growth rates and lower unemployment rates in areas with higher adoption rates. But both access and adoption rates vary with household income levels, with a considerably smaller proportion of lower income households using broadband at home compared to higher income households. There's also wide disparity in broadband access, especially access to higher speed broadband between rural and urban areas, putting the growth prospects of rural areas at a disadvantage. Recent revisions to the CRA rules recognize that a reliable communications infrastructure, such as broadband internet service, can help to revitalize or stabilize underserved, non-metropolitan, middle-income areas. So depository institutions now receive credit for investing in this infrastructure for the purposes of meeting the CRA requirement of serving the needs of low- and moderate-income communities. The Dallas Fed produced a comprehensive guide for financial institutions to help them understand how broadband can benefit the communities they serve 
and how their planned investments could qualify for CRA credit. The guide includes several tables and maps based on U.S. Census Bureau data measuring broadband access at the national level and in the Dallas Fed's district. The Cleveland Fed has provided similar data from the Federal Communications Commission for the 4th District. In addition to data, the Federal Reserve is providing tools to help the public use the data. So let me mention three of these. Last month, the, the Philadelphia and Cleveland Feds released the Home Mortgage Explorer tool. Based on Home, home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, this tool allows users to track trends in mortgage lending at the national, state, metropolitan, and non-metropolitan levels by purpose and type of loan. Information is provided on the reasons a loan application was denied and on applicant and neighborhood income. Recently, the Chicago Fed launched the Peer City Identification Tool. This tool allows a user to easily determine which cities among the 300 included in the data set are experiencing similar trends or challenges along four key themes, racial and socioeconomic composition, economic change and labor market conditions, demographic and economic outlook, and housing affordability, tenure, and housing stock age. The themes were determined based on areas of concern cited by city leaders in more than 200 interviews across 10 cities. Users of the tool can determine which cities among the 300 are considered peers with respect to that particular theme, and the values of the themes in indicators for each of the, of the um, indicators for each of the, uh, the peer cities. The underlying data on the 28 indicators and for all 300 cities are downloadable, so people can use the data in other an analyses as well. A third data tool, Following the Money, was created by the Atlanta and Philadelphia Feds based on data from the Foundation Center. Foundation grants, grants are becoming a more important source of funding for community development, and this tool allows the user to see the distribution of foundation grants across 366 metropolitan areas across the U.S., or for a user to find selection from among these metro areas. Data on the grant volume per capita, on the types of activities the grants are funding, and on the number of community and economic development nonprofits in the metro areas are provided. Now, as the following the money tool reminds us, once potential solutions for challenges facing lower income communities are found, those solutions need to secure funding. While the Federal Reserve cannot make those investments, the Fed's community development function has been working to improve access to credit and capital by helping to match funders to those programs and projects that research has shown to be effective in helping low and moderate income households and communities. The Dallas Fed's work on broadband and the CRA fits this theme by giving banks guidance in determining which broadband projects are CRA eligible. Another very good example is the Boston Fed's Working Cities Challenge, which began in 2013. Boston fed research on small and mid-sized cities that lost manufacturing employment found that resurgent cities, meaning those that successfully reinvigorated their economies, exhibited a high degree of leadership and collaboration among key institutions and individuals, including nonprofits, private citizens, corporations, and government. Informed by this research and designed in partnership with the Boston Fed's network of community development stakeholders, the Working Cities Challenge is a grant competition aimed at strengthening civic collaboration and partnerships to help low-income areas. Eligible cities can make one proposal for an idea or program that will unite the public, private, and nonprofit se sectors and community members in improving the lives of low- and moderate-income people in an enduring way. There are four rounds underway, two in Massachusetts, one in Rhode Island, and one in Connecticut with $10 million in funding to be awarded. In a related effort, the San Francisco Fed is now engaged with the Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge, SPARC, which is modeled on the Working Cities Challenge. My last example of a successful Federal Reserve effort enabling better access to funding is the Kansas City Fed's Investment Connection Program. In their discussions with the Kansas City Fed, banks had indicated they were having trouble identifying CRA-eligible investment opportunities in their service areas, and community leaders were saying they were having trouble getting funding. Seeing a potential opportunity to improve the situation, 
the Kansas City Fed created the Investment Connection Program. Under the program, community and economic development organizations in the district can have project proposals pre-screened by Kansas City Fed staffers to determine whether they're CRA eligible, and then get a chance to pitch their proposals to potential funders, including banks and foundations. So far, the Kansas City Fed has facilitated connections between nearly 60 community organizations and almost 100 funders. Given the regional structure of the Federal Reserve System, a successful program like this one can now potentially be expanded into other regions. So I hope this review of the why, the how, and the what of the Federal Reserve System's community development efforts has been helpful. I do have the privilege of chairing the committee that oversees the community development efforts at the Reserve Banks. I can assure you that the professionals in the community development function at the Fed are dedicated to this work and realize that little could be accomplished without the productive relationships and partnerships they have with many groups represented in this room, including government agencies, financial institutions, foundations, academia, research centers, and community-based organizations. Going forward, the Fed will continue to leverage the benefits from its regional structure. This structure allows the Reserve Banks and the Board of Governors to uncover common issues and find solutions for the challenges facing low and moderate income communities and individuals across the country, while at the same time allowing each Reserve Bank to remain focused on the particular needs in its specific region. We look forward to our continued collaboration with you to make the economy work well for all. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. My name is Bonnie Blankenship, and I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and we're going to take a few questions. Let's take the first from Pigeon Hole, please. How does the Federal Reserve's community development function assess its impact on communities? Well, that's a good question, because one of the things that we try to do at the Fed is to always go back and say, are we productively using our resources in the most effective way? Um, we partner with, again, many of the people in this room, and we do ask the questions about, you know, are these programs or are our uh, programs effective? You will get after this uh, program here a survey to fill out where you're going to be asked to evaluate um, this program in particular. Um, but every time we do something, we do follow up. We usually do a debrief where we actually ask whether we're actually meeting the needs of our, of our community. And Bonnie, you've been instrumental in doing some of this work and making sure that we're, we're structuring our programs here. Um, to identify issues that are going to be ones that are relevant to our region. But also, I think if you see around the room, there's a lot of people from the Fed here, precisely because a lot of these issues are resonant in a lot of the communities in which we, we operate. So, so again, we're always trying to assess what programs are working. Uh, we like to partner with other institutions who have data that we can then analyze. Um, and uh, we hope we'll we continue to be able to do this. Um. Terrific. We are also going to take some uh, questions from the floor. So if you have questions, you can go to the microphone. But we um, will take another question from Pigeonhole, please. How does the Fed, oh. as the president of the Cleveland Fed, what has been your influence on policy matters discussed here this week, like housing, opioids, and inequality? Well, I think most of us in this room care about these issues as citizens. Um, I think the reserve banks do play an important role in sort of bringing the hard research to bear on these problems. And also, as I said in the speech, you know, we're, we're, we're engaged in trying to evaluate not only the size of these problems, but also what our effective programs are. If you were in some of the sessions today and yesterday, um, you know, I think a lot of us were, were, wow, these problems are hard. But at the same time, we talked about a lot of potential solutions. So 
I think my role as president of the Federal Reserve Bank is to try to bring these kind of programs um, out to the public, bring some of these issues to bear, um, to, to, to light, I mean, and, and hopefully, you know, generate more uh, effective solutions coming, coming to be brought to bear. We will follow up these programs with continuing effort. Um, last year, the Cleveland Fed sponsored um, uh, something on lead poisoning, because in Cleveland, this is an issue, um, a long time issue about the health of our communities, and we have a lead problem in terms of lead-based paint in some of the houses that we we're talking about were abandoned. We're following that up with work um, after that. So again, I think our role is to sort of bring these issues to light. We can't affect the policies. We're not the ones who can set those policies, but we can work with partners to make sure that we're getting the knowledge and um, data and tools that can allow people who are in, you know, the serious researchers in this area to then get that research in the hands of the policymakers that can affect change. I routinely go and talk to legislators as part of my role as a Reserve Bank president, and I can tell you that, you know, they're very concerned about what's going on back in their district. So again, they rely on our research as well, and so we think of ourselves as a clearinghouse to sort of connect people to convene the right people in the right room. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I think it's very important that we are uh, above the politics and, and viewed as sort of this convener and maybe catalyzing action. Well, you've also made visits across the district as well. So we were in Eastern Kentucky last year, so you can see exactly what's hand happening on the ground. I mean, I, and I think this is true of what, the, again, the regional structure of the Fed is. We do routinely, as presidents, go out and visit all parts of the district, including low and modern income areas. The Kentucky trip was um, a very uh, good one for me because I really could see a program that was working in terms of uh, allowing education for people who had been working in the coal mines right, to be able to do a new productive job, which was laying sort of these fiber optic lines and broadband lines, electrical lines, but also for broadband um, in these rural, rural neighborhoods, partnering with a community, um, a Hazard Community College. And, you know, in talking to the people in the program, you know, they were, ama they were amazing people because they had to per persevere through a lot of, it was a lot of coursework, a lot of physical work to get up on these lines. And, I, and, and you talk to people and you just really uh, are inspired by what, what they can do. So, you know, I would never be able to do either coal mining or going up to those lines. But, you know, you rely on those things. And it was a very good discussion. Then the question for the Fed then going forward is, okay, that's one program. Is it scalable? You know, how would you develop those kinds of programs? What's effective in the programs? What's not effective in the program? It turned out that the, a lot of mentoring had to go on with the community, mm -hmm. um, with the community college, with the students, but that was happening. And so, again, you get insights by actually being in the field. Um, and, and this is not just me. All the Fed presidents are doing this work. Um, and I think it's informing us about some of the um, not only, you know, you talk up here about monetary policy, but when you see sort of how things evolve and throughout some of these low and moderate income neighborhoods, it gives you new insights into sort of, you know, what we should be focusing on. How do we evaluate whether our policies are effective or not? And sort of some of the longer run challenges that some people in these neighborhoods are facing. Excellent. Let's take another, oh, we have somebody at the microphone. Lou? Uh, Thank you, Dr. Mester, another great policy summit, great staff putting on a great event, so thank you very much. Um, in the field that we're working in, we continue to have millennials say, I'm not going to get into buying a house now because interest rates are going up. Um, interest rates are going up, but at 4.25, it's still inexpensive money compared uh, to previous. How would you, how would you explain uh, the increase of interest rates and not quashing the need for people to continue to buy homes. And then also looking into the future in uh, 18 months to 24, do you see that still going higher? Um, so two parts, one that you might not be able to answer, but the other that, um, <laughs> you know, uh, how, how do we explain that, that, that money is not expensive and, and you're not gonna see 2.75 again? 
So, I mean, when we set monetary policy, right, we're trying to set it so that it meets our dual mandate goals of price stability and maximum employment. And, you know, the economy, the underlying fundamentals of the economy are, are pretty good right now. So what the Fed has done, right, is started to gradually remove some of the high levels of accommodation that we had to put in place during the financial crisis and the great uh, recession, right? We added a lot of accommodation then because we felt it was necessary to support the economy. As the economy has started to pick up, the expansion has continued. Right now, it's, we've gotten to a point where it's time to gradually remove some of that accommodation. Failure to do that, right, in a timely way would end up being missing our goals, right, and then leading to a case where we might have to raise interest rates too quickly in the future, and that could risk a recession. So again, this is an act, a balancing act, right? We want to set policy and interest rates as our main tool of policy so that we can prolong the expansion, right? So the idea is to set interest rates and calibrate them so that the expansion is sustainable going forward. And that's, that's what it's about. And, you know, whether interest rates, you know, um, go up, you said, in the next three years or so, you know, we put out as policymakers um, a set of projections uh, every other meeting four times a year. Um, and that set of projections were just released um, a couple of weeks ago. And in those projections, we do have a gradual upward path of interest rates. But nothing is preset in the sense of, you know, we're going to react to the data as it comes in, as it informs our median run outlook. Um, and we'll have to adjust policy to calibrate it. But the aim is always to have a sustainable expansion aimed at meeting our dual mandate objectives. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, people in the community should understand that, you know, we're, we're aiming to keep the economy, you know, healthy, um, and that's why we're doing this. We're not doing this because we want to slow down the economy. We, we really want to keep the expansion um, going at a sustainable um, pace. Let's take another question from Pigeonhole. In a progressively post <laughs> truth world, what strategies do you use to get people to care about data and facts when addressing community policy issues? I never heard this post truth world. Uh, all right. I I struggle with these issues, too. Um, I'll admit that. You know, I think the best defense is bringing the best data and economic analysis and to bear on these issues. I, I firmly believe that people do care about facts, despite some of the rhetoric these days. I think people do want to know the truth. And I think that everyone in this room should support those kind of analyses. As I said, you know, we at the Fed take this very, very, very seriously, the public trust that we've built up. Um, and our credibility ma matters a lot to us. And so what we're going to always do is we're going to bring the best analysis we can bear, bring to bear on all these issues. Um, I'd encourage everyone in this room to do the same thing. And sometimes, as you could tell today, the speeches get to be long. And they're complicated sentences. I, I write very long sentences, unfortunately. I've been trying to work on shorter sentences. But sometimes things are complicated. And I think that, um, you know, all we have to, you know, you have to, when you're a professor, and the professors in the room can, can relate to this, right, you're always taught, you have to say things multiple times in multiple different ways. And I think that's what we have to do here, is like bring the best analysis you can to bear, get it out there, keep saying it, say it in different ways, but continue to work to do that. And that's the best offense, I think, that we have. Um, I firmly believe people do care about facts. I firmly believe people do um, want to know what's going on. And uh, just because there, there's all this other stuff going on at the same time, I don't think that undermines the fact that people care about these issues. And there's a lot of dedicated people in this room who are working hard to solve some of these issues. At the same time, there's no simple solution, right? These are complex issues, but we're all analysts here and we can do our part, right, to analyze the issue do create new data sets, create new tools, allow people to have them, 
and continue to work. And I, and I guess I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, that work is going to win the day. Okay. Let's take another question from Pigeonhole, please. What kind of research would you like to see to make more progress in dealing with opioids and with the declines in manufacturing? Yeah. So these are, I, I thought the session on opioids was very interesting. I learned a lot of new things about, about it. Um, and I think one of the sessions this morning talked about sort of the fact that economists have not done as good a job as we could in terms of thinking about distributional aspects. So declines in manufacturing, globalization, um, technological change, right? Those are big, big trends. A decline in manufacturing is one, is a case in point, you know, a lot of the manufacturing jobs went overseas, right? Trade, free trade allows that kind of dis redistribution from country, one country to another, right? But when that happens, you know, it is true that you can get a better, you know, economy because of technological change and globalization. But the distribution of those gains isn't necessarily even. And so I think economists can do a lot of research where we actually start to identify who are the winners and who are the losers because of these broad, broad things going on. And then what policies would be the right ones to address them while allowing the benefits of globalization and technological change to be captured, right? So I think, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm an economist, so I don't want to denigrate economics because a lot of, you know, earlier we didn't have the tools to be able to do that. We didn't have models that actually allowed for different kinds of people in the economy, right? We had what economists call representative agent models. So you get one, one person that represented everyone. Well, now we have the tools to be able to do this kind of analysis. And that's going on. That work's going on. And that's great. I mean, that's going to give us a lot more insight. The opioid epidemic is, is a very important one, obviously, in Ohio, but as we saw in the session, in a lot of areas of the country. And, you know, there are things going on in terms of protocols for, you know, giving out opioids for doctors to follow, which I think are hopeful. But again, you have to go back a step and say, okay, well, what's causing people to feel that they need right, opioids, because it's not all prescription drugs now. It's becoming a bigger issue than that. I'm, I'm brought back to sort of the things that are close to me, which is like economic development, job opportunities. Are we allowing, you know, are we actually addressing things that allow people to have hope, right, that they can get a job and they can improve their family and can make life good? And maybe that can also be part of this research agenda. So there's direct things that really address opioids for example, the protocols and things that you might want hospital doctors to do, um, and 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 things in terms of as we talked about in this session, you know, maybe mandatory drug sentence, you know, sentences for drugs. Maybe we need to rethink all that. But there's also sort of the economic opportunity side of things. You know, why do people feel desperate enough to get into these situations? Is there a way that we can think about that economic opportunity as a way to address some of these longer run issues? So I'd like to see some more work on that. Terrific. We have a question from the audience. Again, thank you for the conference. It's been very enjoyable. I know more about opioid addiction than I really ever wanted to. And um, depressing the hell out of my wife when I went home last night. But it's good to know. Uh, I have a question for you concerning uh, non-depository lenders and uh, CRA. Um, I know that when people think non-depository lenders, the first one that comes to their mind is Quicken Loans, and these are all internet loans. But there are, since a great majority of mortgage loans are originated by uh, non-depositories that do have locations, is there any uh, plans to work on getting them involved in actually meeting any CRA requirements? So I think there is, um, I just saw a report that the administration is thinking about the CRA. Obviously, that's not the Fed we implement, but, you know, as one of the federal regulators of the law. But I think there is a rethink of sort of CRA um, in general. Um, but I don't know any more detail than that. I just know it's part of a conversation that's going on at, in, at the government, federal government level. Thank you. 
Okay, let's take one final question from Pigeonhole, please. Job openings are plentiful. How do we get people to avail themselves of social services, particularly employment, that can help them get employment? Throwing money at the problem isn't working. So we routinely talk to um, businesses who have opening, job openings, and also with some, some uh, um, labor representatives. And what they tell us is that there are job openings, but there are isn't a lot of qualified workers that they're being able to find, right? So there seems to be some mismatch between some of the people who are looking for jobs and some of the jobs that are available. And some of the discussion at the conference was talking precisely about um, how do you improve the skill sets of people so that they are able to take on work um, at the companies that are looking for jobs. And I think that's gonna be a key thing. It's like, we have this, situation where labor markets for all intents and purposes are tight, right? Meaning that there doesn't seem to be a supply of workers, but we do have people still looking for jobs. And how do we make sure that they are, have access to the educational programs? Um, and more and more, right, in a global economy, we gotta be much more, I would say, nimble um, in terms of how we make sure that people do get the education they need and the skill sets they need. It doesn't necessarily have to be a college education, right? There are training programs and other kinds of programs like the community college program um, that we talked about earlier, but that's gotta be a focus. I mean, how do you get people to get, to be able to develop those skill sets and give them the opportunity to, to, to do that? And it's not one thing, right? There's multiple ways of doing that, but I think that's gotta be a focus. I don't know this throwing money at the problem isn't working. I'm not sure I would, would I, that, that's too broad a, a brush, but I do agree that we, we at the Fed and with you can find what programs work, are they scalable, what's effective, and I think that's something that we can partnership with you all on. Terrific. Well, with that, I'd like to thank Loretta, and let's give Loretta a, hand of, a round of applause, please. And I'm gonna close out the policy summit. So as I said, my name is Bonnie Blankenship. I am a regional community development advisor with the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And as Loretta mentioned, we will be sending out a survey after the close of the policy summit. Please complete it. We take your comments very seriously in planning our next event. So two years ago, at the policy summit in 2015 in Pittsburgh, I mentioned to our vice president, Paul Cabot, that I would like to be the project manager for the policy summit this year. And Paul told me he never turned down volunteer labor. <laughs> so through this process, I've quickly learned that it takes many people to make this event happen, and I'd like to thank a few of them at this time. First, I'd like to thank the speakers for giving their time and talent to make this a great event. Please give the speakers a round of applause. I'd also like to thank the many departments at the Federal Reserve. And if you would, please stand and if you had a hand in planning this event. So the session organizers, the community development department, the research department, commu corporate communications, conference and events, media relations, web services, information technology, financial services, our volunteers, our partners from Philly and Minneapolis. So it takes a lot of people to make this happen, and please give them a round of applause. And finally, I'd like to thank you, the attendees, who took time from your busy schedule these last two days to participate. And with that, I wanted to officially close Policy Summit 2017. We hope to see you in 2019. Safe travels, everybody.